feel like Gordon Bombay would have taken his career to even further heights. Everything's flashy, everything's cocaine, everything's fun. Open wide for some soccer. I don't care what you think about, what your personal thoughts are at home. I care that you hate the Cowboys. Call this college rule. Welcome back, everybody, to the Sports Experience Podcast. Dom and Chris here, and uh, before we begin, as always, we are down here at Engel Studio in downtown Tucson for all of your audio needs, recording here at our producer Ty's studio. Uh, in addition, you saw our social medias come up there at the very beginning. Uh, make sure you follow, like, listen, and subscribe, essentially, to everything we put out. Uh, you have any suggestions, uh, let us know. We'll actually make those videos. Yep. So uh, we've been doing it before, and we're going to keep on doing it. And uh, Chris... Just a couple comics who enjoy sports. That's right. And uh, who do we got today? We got uh, probably one of the best defensive players ever, if not the best. We got Dikembe Mutombo. You going to get the name? You want me to hit the I'll, name? I'll, 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 how about you try the name right. and then I'll do it? Because I won't be as uh, off. Like I won't be as off, you know? So uh, go ahead. That was a little insult. <laughs> no. I mean, I... I... I don't. I'm not gonna get it right. No, no. I'll get. I'll get one part. Kende Matumbo in Bond in. Nope. Mukamba Jean Jacques Wanatombo. Better than me. Better. I. I have to well, get this. It. I knew the third one. I don't know what that is, but the MP always messes me up. I'm like, ah, eh, oh, uh, oh, damn it. Yeah, just um, can't do it. Yeah, but he uh, definitely has a name that. Uh, is worth it, you know. Uh, it's it's definitely when you look at somebody's like long ass name, you're just like, all right. But this guy, he fits it. He he's sounds like a foot, very important person, and his voice fits it. Well, he's got that almost French accent to it. Yep, well, I love it. Born June twenty fifth, nineteen sixty two, in uh, Leopoldville, uh, Kinshasa, uh, Democratic Republic of Belgian. Con There's a lot of names yep, here. There There's was a, a lot of names on that one, too. Let's just say we, we're going to call it the Democratic Republic of the Congo because that's what it is now. Yep. Um, one of 10 kids to Samuel and Biamba Marie. His dad was a school principal and very involved in the Congo's education department. And in this, in the sense of like where he grew up and when he grew up, they were technically like a, a better off family, if you will. Yeah. Like his dad had actually like a really good job. They, they were really like uh, pushing uh, education and that kind of, you know what I mean? So it he spoke four languages. Fluently. I was just going to say that. Yeah, go ahead. Well, so he, he speaks English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and then he speaks because there's all these Local, like, yeah, because yeah, he speaks actually technically five different <laughs> like, but they're very similar in dialect of African um, languages from his region. So you're just like, well, technically he speaks like 10 languages. Yes. And, and a very smart individual. Yes. Like before he grows to his specific height he uh he would go to regular college probably on smart people scholarship well i think technically he does yeah so like he doesn't go for on any kind of basketball um we'll get into it yep so he goes to batobo college there in congo or zaire at the did, time did you see that he grew up playing soccer yes and, and so it was soccer martial, martial arts the martial arts we talked about clyde drexler at six seven i was just i just <laughs> wanted to talk about this because nobody was encouraging these absolutely gigantic guys to be like you should continue this martial arts it would have been like kareem and that bruce lee enter the dragon it's just like dude i don't know that footprint on your chest <laughs> like once upon a time in hollywood and that yes exactly but could you even imagine his voice coming out it was just like not today <laughs> just punches uh -oh. you in the face and gives you the finger wag but at whatever 15 16 he becomes six six or that, whatever that's just Unreal though, with the, with that type of reach, there's no Chuck Norris jokes anymore. No, if he's Dikembe done, just goes for those belts. Yes, but he's, he's our action star. But he said his brother built him a hoop and gave him a basketball and said, "You start <laughs> doing this now." <laughs> Your height tells you you yes, should do because this. he had one of those ridiculous growth spurts where you're like, "Oh, you're going to be the biggest kid around." And he did have other family members, um, like. I believe brothers as well as cousins down the road who played mm -hmm. not at quite the highest level that he but, did, but also played competitive basketball, yep. uh, college basketball. Yeah. I think yes. Mm -hmm. um, at age 16, um, 
Yeah, at age 16, he was suggested basketball. And by 1987, he moves to America at age 21 to attend American College at Georgetown. So he has no real, like, formal... On a U.S. aid scholarship. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was the thing. So he goes to become a doctor. Yeah. That was his plan. It wasn't his plan to, like, be on the basketball team. He didn't have any, like, super formal basketball training until he became 16 17 yeah. you know what i mean it, it just wasn't there so it's almost like tim duncan only a hurricane didn't destroy his pool he's just like oh i happen to be seven foot two yep like, no yeah seriously though and so he goes to georgetown and patrick then, ewing in the same type of mold the yep. great defensive center but then we get into what he says is probably his biggest like basketball influence because he's a little bit older he's 21 mm-hmm um, buying he, the team beer and he meets john thompson and john thompson says if you give me four years i can make you into an nba player that's like what he was saying to him because he just he did not he had like the raw ability he just did not have the skill yeah oh kind of like akeem but coming from nigeria and he playing soccer and handball and stuff though another thing i thought was interesting he said hakeem was like one of his biggest like 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 guys that he looked up to but he was so close to that bridge because he started so late he was just yeah. like he was like my first like my first idol in basketball and then i played against him and yeah. you're just like that's kind of weird because normally like you grow up playing with uh, like looking at people he was just like i don't know he was like the first guy and then i was and like he played forever yep freaking same ever. with same, same with, with the dikembe yep. yeah oh my god could you imagine if he was your physician though uh, just walking in like cough yeah do it i'm hands. scared <laughs> all right my dick doesn't look that small come on <laughs> your hands are too big this isn't fair to kembe we go through this every appointment that's right no bring the nurse with the small hands <laughs> no 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 the ones with the kenny pickett size hands <laughs> Uh, so he, do he doesn't play his freshman season, though. Nope. Um, uh, sophomore. Uh, he's already starting to show promise. Um, like, he's Defense developing. Defensively, yeah, he is. In the paint. Well, and he said this. He just goes, well, I got it right away that I could just block the ball. Yeah. And then he was also on this team with Alonzo Mourning. <laughs> it's another Hall of Fame center. I want to know how they – I'm assuming everyone just shot – from the perimeter against yes them. like I, I'm, I, I'm assuming that's the only thing you can do yes i can't imagine there was any penetration against them because no penetration. especially especially if you literally like get one of them to come to your weak side and pass it over the other one's right there yeah like, it's just like you're not going back to the lab nope. solving crimes full you know what i mean but uh so that first season though or his sophomore season i guess the first season he played he had 12 block shots in a game yep this is a stacked team. You have uh, other NBAers like uh, Charles Smith and Jaron Jackson. Um, they go twenty nine and five, and they win the Big East regular season and tournament titles. Go all the way to the Elite Eight and lose to the great Satan and Duke of those great Duke teams. I was just going to say this is kind of like him, like with the Bulls, where they're just like, man, he was on some great teams, but he really went against some great teams. Yeah. So it's tough to it's tough to be like, yeah, but uh, yeah. Um, 89-90, he's starting now. Yep. Um, you still got morning there. Um, this season, he shares the Big East 10 Defensive Player of the Year award with morning because, like we said, you're not scoring in the paint. And they got the nickname Rejection Row. Which is great. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love it. I love Rejection Row. Um, they, he's all Big East this season, averaging yep. double figures for points a game and rebounds. And uh, unfortunately, they lose in the second round of the tournament to Xavier. So there, but this is when he kind of proves that he can be an offensive threat because that was kind of like the maybe the knock early on where they're just like, no, 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 we get how defensive, like ridiculous he is, but is he going to be able to be offensive in the next, in, in the yeah, next, like you, at the you, next you level? You know exactly what you're getting defensively. Yes, at like, and we'll see in the NBA. It definitely translates, particularly the era that he plays in and everything else. But like for a guy that started at 16, that's what I mean. And this is I, when I his... think Duncan even started earlier than that. Yeah, I think so too. So, uh, but I mean to be, and this is when the Big East was like awesome. Yeah, this is when the Big East was the Big East. So like he's entering this team. Grand, you know, Alonzo Mourning is a great guy to have. You know, yeah, your front court with you. But, exactly. Um, next season, uh, he goes. 15, 12, almost five blocks a game. Mm -hmm. I found that stat just... There are guys that don't get five blocks a week. 
No, it's <laughs> like it's crazy when you look at his his average blocks on season to season. It, it's kind of scary when you think of like a guard driving in. You're just like, oh, no, I'm just gonna dish it. <laughs> this is this is for our perimeter shooters. This is their day. Yep. Today. Um Big East player of the defensive player of the year by himself. Yep. Um, all Big East once again. Uh, although they lose in the tournament. Uh, still caps off a pretty incredible college career for him. And this is kind of where the NBA starts to look at maybe the potential of these players because they were like, well, he's not fully developed. Yeah. Before this time, as far as Africa, I can't think of anybody besides Hakeem. Be that besides come, Hakeem, no. That had like come over and like... And granted, he's not Hakeem like, because Hakeem's the first pick in the draft where for you know three years in college, he's the best player probably yep. in college basketball. But uh, did want to add in 1991, he graduates uh, undergrad with degrees in linguistics and diplomacy, mm -hmm. which not 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 medicine, but he's got better things to do. Well, than, diplomacy kind of makes sense for what he <laughs> embarks in post career, post -career but yeah. we'll see his finger wagging in this diplomacy. Yeah, finger uh, wagging. <laughs> by, uh, so the 91 NBA draft, he's one of the top prospects. Um Decent class of some guys, not, not necessarily stacked. Yeah, but not we'll stacked, see, but, but guys we recognize from our childhood. Top heavy, I would yeah. say. Uh, first pick out the gate, a guy we brought up before, Grandmama Larry Johnson mm -hmm. for the Charlotte Hornets. And then Kenny Anderson goes to the Nets. Billy Owens goes to, I believe, the Kings, and then they flip him to the Warriors. And yeah, that, that was a weird one. Mess. And then at number four, the Denver Nuggets are picking, and they take a chance on Dikembe Mutombo and it makes a hell of a lot of sense because from what my dad told me in the 80s the Nuggets were a very exciting team to watch that just didn't play any defense yeah I think they said from like it was like maybe 88 or 89 they had been the worst defensive yeah. team and before that they weren't like better it was just they were a bad defensive team like they could score 120, 130 a night. But would get and with Alex English, and you go to the conference finals against Showtime. But y your defense is just such a liability, yeah. <laughs> such a liability. So he goes to the Nuggets, and they're kind of in the middle of a rebuild. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say it: he becomes a marketable star for him pretty much out the gate. Like he's a solid player for a very young and kind of developing team. Well, he does exactly what you want from this player and this is the thing that i was saying with the in georgetown is his offense going to translate to nba it does he i think he he averages like a double double in this first one but with like three blocks yeah that's the thing that i, I went through a stat sheet every time you're just like oh it's like plus three blocks every average every single season and then sometimes he gets up into the fours where yeah. you're just like this is insane it's, it's like 10 it's like 10 years like yeah. an entire career's worth mm -hmm. just of that um he's very marketable as i said before with his patented finger wag the well, old adidas campaign the no man fly man does not fly in the house of matumbo well it, somebody uh i saw this interview with him and he talked about it and he was just like no, no no i came up with that on purpose so that i could be marketed and you're just like oh yeah this guy's like really smart <laughs> like he literally he's not was just showing like, anybody up he wants to get no, paid he, yes that was literally what he was saying he was just like no no, no i i got what i was good at which was blocking the ball everybody would react at it and it was like oh i should do something that people associate with me they were doing it 20 years later in geico commercials <laughs> yep like not today not <laughs> but he makes the all-star team as a rookie yep uh first team all rookie and they're wearing the old tetris nuggets unis which were pretty dope i love those back, like just I agree. such a mid-80s type of uh, holdover with the scene uh, yeah with the cityscape and the yeah those are great oh, those nba logos anyway uh following season uh 92 93 averages almost 14 points 13 rebounds three and a half blocks granted the nuggets are still kind of crappy but he he's a legitimate NBA, like he's starting to become an NBA star. I was just going to say, like, if he had a better team around him at this time, but like you said, they were in the middle of a rebuild and he was almost like that first piece they went after and then really didn't get much around him after that. So they're, I mean, they're trying. They got yeah, they're trying. Ellis uh, in 92, I believe, who was great until injuries just sapped that dude's mm -hmm. career. It sucked. 
Um, they had um, brought in Robert Pack from those uh, uh, Clyde Drexler Blazers teams. And uh, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, the old yep. Chris Jackson, yep. the, the uh, Steph Curry 1.0, I guess is the best way. Uh, that's pretty good because he really was a, a point guard above his. And that's the thing is he like. He was a better player on LSU than a man in a penis were back in the late I don't know 80s, about early 90s. We got to check that penis line <laughs> to be sure. But the, the I feel like there was a lot of, there was like a lot of hype. And then obviously like. They just kind of didn't follow through. Well, the crabby part is we, we, injury, and well, it's not even the injuries. It's they're in the Western Conference where everyone, and we've talked about it probably so for stacked. so many different teams. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't matter who it is. You're right. So uh, ninety three, ninety four, though they finally break through. Uh, Dikembe has a great year. He leads the league in blocks. Yep, four point one double double again. They finish forty two and forty. First winning record in a hot minute there for the Nugs. So they get into the playoffs. As the eighth seed. As the eighth. And they play the. On a previous episode. That's right. Too. They play the number one Supersonics mm-hmm. with uh, one Sean Kemp. If you haven't bought his marijuana in Seattle, please do so. Or if you haven't met any of his tons of kids. You will in Seattle. Yes, you will. Uh, so they go, they go up to Seattle. Uh, they get They get handled. Pretty mightily in the first two yes. games of that series. And a lot of people were like, okay, this is obvious eight versus one. That's yeah. like, you know. Because at this point in NBA history, an eight seed had never beat a one seed since the playoffs moved to that format. That's right. In And this is a five-game series, by the way. Um, so they come home back to McNichols, and uh, they steal the next two a lot based on Matumbo, just completely shutting down the Sonics in the paint. Mm-hmm. Um, they win game three by 17. They win game four in overtime. Um, they go back to um, Seattle for game five. And on May 7th, 1994, they end up winning in overtime, 98 to 94. Pulling and, off a huge upset. And I was just going to say, and he grabs the, the rebound right at the end of the game. And it's probably his, D- Dikembe's most iconic NBA moment where he grabs it and just like kind of like holds the ball and yeah it, it's a very uh it's a very touching moment because like you said an eighth seed had never beat a first seed the west at that time was so lopsided that it really was these powerhouses and then even if you had a good team you were still like well they're so much more you know built than we are so they go to the next round though and this was an to, I remember this this was an even crazier series they play Utah they oh, go yeah, down lost. 3 to nothing yep. then win 3 in a row and end up losing game 7 91 to 81 mm-hmm. but I wanted to bring up in this play in the playoffs this year for the Nuggets Matumbo averaged 5.8 blocks a game he got 31 blocks in the in the <laughs> Supersonic series I saw that <laughs> unbelievable mm-hmm. Yeah, he was a uh, – I'll be honest, he probably was the best defensive center we've ever seen. In an era where, like, there, there were, were a lot of awesome centers who played And power defense. forwards. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There, there were a lot of great big men in this era, and he was uh, – I mean – I don't know, Hakeem. God, it's so hard to it's so hard to differentiate, you know, because they're just so good. It's so awesome. Uh, so ninety four, ninety five, the following season, Dan Issel resigns. Yep, they bring in Bernie Bickerstaff, and uh, they have a kind of a late season run to finish forty one and forty one, and they get the eight seed. Um, this year, Matumbo is fantastic. 11.5 points a game, twelve point five rebounds, three point nine blocks to lead the league. All star again and defensive player of the year. This is his first. first one. Yep. So he's gonna he's gonna win a couple more of these. Yep. Uh, by the end of it. They they go into the playoffs again, you're thinking upset again. Yeah, yeah maybe. No? No. That, no, they get annihilated. Yeah. San Antonio sweeps them, wasn't even close. Um and then this is a 95, 96, he's playing the last year of his contract. Mm-hmm. He has he wants to stay in Denver. Yes, he, like that, and it made it clear. Yeah, he 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 uh, he told the front office, "You have to keep me. Mm-hmm. You, I want to stay here." Um, has another terrific season, four and a half blocks. I, yeah, he yeah. so, and this is the thing that you see that some franchises really drop the ball on. So he literally is. They missed the playoffs, by the way. So they're, this is yes. the beginning of the 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 Norm McDonald making fun of the Nuggets at the ESPYS era for the Nuggets. But even not re-signing him, which is what they choose to do, 
you have to sign and trade him. You have yeah. to get something for your first round pick. That's the best defensive player in the league. It's it's crazy to think of that. It go it actually goes down like he's this. the most important player on your freaking team. Yes, like I mean, it, he averages double double since he's come into the league with the most blocks. With the and on a team that is not featuring a hell of a lot of other superstars. No. Um, he want. I guess what happened is he wanted a ten year contract. Yes, he, he and asked for that. And it, it, I heard two different stories. If I'm honest, he said he asked for it. They pretty much just shut down talks and were like not even going to negotiate. But the ten year contract wasn't a thing in the, the NBA at that time, so they probably figured this is fucking absurd. But then what he said was he was just like, but we didn't even like negotiate to like take it down because he then signs with the Hawks for a lot less. But he was just like. I thought I would go in and ask for 10 and maybe get a seven year contract. That's, yeah. that's literally what he said, but he was just like, but I guess they had different plans because they really weren't interested in re-signing him. Bigger staff and ownership said that was their biggest regret yep. of what happened was just not because he goes to Atlanta five years, 55 mil. And he goes to a, actually a good Hawks team. Yes. Like, I mean, they're, I mean, they're a, you know, a top five seed in the East. I mean, they're really good. Um, Steve Smith, the guy who was drafted after him in 91, is there yep. doing his thing, sharp shooting. Um, gets off to a great start in 96, 97. They, go, they win 56 games. Yeah, they were a good team in the East. Wins Defensive Player of the Year. Second time. And then 97, 98 wins Defensive Player of the Year again, an all-star both years. Between the two seasons, averaging 3.3 blocks, 13.4 points. But because they're in the East of this era. I was era, just going to say, yep. It's not fair. You think of guys like him and Reggie Miller where it's just like, bro, sorry. But, yeah. but uh, No not, amount of Cheryl Miller energy can save them. Yeah. <laughs> 98, they go to the playoffs. They beat the Pistons in five. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say this. Or 97, yeah. 97, yeah. The, but the he has games in playoffs or he has these games that are just so massive that they are it, – it's crazy to think of like how – good he is and in this he in game one he had 26 points 15 rebounds he averaged a double double while they were beating the pistons yeah um and people were saying they were just like oh is this hawks team gonna maybe do something what happens in the next round they run into the bulls yeah the 96 97 bulls end up losing the, the following year they don't they don't even make it out of the first round yep uh to more to the uh, yeah, to Charlotte. his buddy. Yeah. yeah, which is so funny where you, they meet up like that. But the the newly formed Charlotte Hornets dethrone, and, and it's so weird because like they were good teams, but nowhere near good enough to beat no Michael I mean, or probably Reggie at that time. Yeah, in right. those paces, in those pacers. Even the Knickerbockers were still holding That's on. That's true. You yeah, know, still they had a good team. Ewing, yeah. yeah, another George, another yeah, Georgetown. A lot of the big yep. men into the uh, league. Um, 98-99, the lockout, so he just plays 99. Um, they tried to ban the finger wag. Yeah. and he just like, come on, man. He protested that for a while and ate some fines, I heard. Well, he, I, what he ended up doing, he f found out it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be uh, an offense if he did it to the crowd and not the players. Not, so you're not yep. taunting it, so you're doing it to the crowd. Or just to, like, nobody, you know? Yeah. Like, that's, yeah. Uh, this season has fantastic year for Atlantic. Uh, almost 11 points, over 12 rebounds, almost three blocks a game. Um, I guess I saw something online where it said IBM voted him like in their player of the year computer formula, yeah. the best player in the NBA that year. Yeah, it was like for stats, whatever the advanced metrics is at that time, you know. Mm -hmm. They were printing it out on that printer that was like, eh, eh. <laughs> um, but yeah, he just like stat lines you, and again, he has. I think he's defensive player of the or no no that's next year. Yeah. Uh, um but yeah, he he has oh he does have a, a ridiculous game where he has 27 points, 29 that's rebounds. Unbelievable. And 6 blocks. Versus the Timberwolves who I don't think had like a really good big man at that time. No, we Kevin like, Garnett's not a great big man. No, at all. not <laughs> well, <laughs> No, I just mean uh for center. Yeah, so no, I know. KG's yeah, over there on, on the power forward. KG's given up 3 and, 4 inches and that's not good. And so much on reach too. Yeah. Um but he has these games that are so, 29 rebounds is such a ridiculous stat. But see the thing was 
it, he he was tall, he was built, but he would use those pointy elbows and just like if you caught one of those, you're out. I saw. It's it's like and, and they're not like meaty; they're like really bony. Just I I uh, I, be, I listened to a couple of podcasts with him on it, trying to get you know. He is so hard to understand. Yes. It, it, and it's not that he has like his accent or anything else. His voice is it's so his vo deep. Yes. Too. And like grovelly. It's such a deep register. You're just like, wait, what? <laughs> um, he's arguing with Shaq in obviously a, a playful way. He just goes, I've never elbowed Shaq. Shaq's never elbowed me. And Shaq just goes, I've never elbowed. To That's crazy. <laughs> and then they literally, like whatever show it was, pulled up a couple of clips of them just being like, <laughs> like yeah. they, it was such a different NBA back then. It you would be sent to jail now for that in the NBA. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so 99, they advance all the way to the second round in the East, but they lose to the Knicks. Uh, he did lead all uh, players that year in the postseason in rebounds per game. He had almost 14 rebounds a game. Um, the next year, he's an all-star. Uh, I believe you said defensive player of the year. Yep. Um, career and league high, 14.1 rebounds. Which is insane. But to get that out of your big man? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, my God. Um Fall, no postseason though. The Hawks are kind of this they're is before on a we get dip. into the crappiness Hawks era. Yeah. Um, 2000, 2001, he starts with Atlanta, another All Star season. Um, he, so at this All Star game, leading the league, thirteen point five rebounds too. Yep, at this All Star game, it's the East. Mm -hmm. So he teams up with Larry Brown and Allen Iverson. Yes. And they, I think they were trailing by like ten in the fourth, and they kind of take over the two of them. And the East goes on and wins, and a lot of trade rumors start to circulate about him going to the 76ers because they were like, that's like the piece that they're missing. Well, I mean, when you look at the two of the two best teams in the West at this point, yep, Los Angeles and San Antonio, what, what do, are, both what do they have? have? Yes. Tall men. Tall men good at scoring. And a, and a ridiculously good scoring guard. Yeah. Whatever shooting guards, uh, you know what I mean. Supporting casts in the backcourt that yes. are also very good. But yes, that is literally so. A lot of people said like that All Star game, whatever shenanigans kind of happens. Larry Brown was like, "You should come to the 76ers. We'll yeah. fucking win a championship." <laughs> Look, the teams we're going to be playing aren't very good on the way there. No, you can relax. <laughs> don't don't worry. Dikembe. You know you're on the Hawks. Yeah. <laughs> so February twenty second, two thousand one, he's traded with uh, Rashawn McLeod. Um, Tony Kukoc uh, for Tony Kukoc, uh, Nazi Muhammad, Theo Ratliff, and Pepe Sanchez. Um, These are some names, but they're past prime. You know what I mean? It, it's, much, it yeah. really is. You I see, remember that guy like five years before. Being yes, awesome. it, it's really the last six months of a contract where they're just like, all right, let's let's get rid of him. <laughs> let's see what we're doing. So they go to the uh, they go to the playoffs. Uh, they beat the Pacers in four. Yep. Um, we talked about it in our Vince Carter episode. They had an awesome seven-game series with the Raptors that they end up pulling out mm -hmm. in the semifinals. Vince Carter, Allen Iverson episode, <laughs> yes. you know. And then they end up beating a really good Bucks team. And set with uh, he got game. Yep. And with Ray Don Allen. And, and, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Winning seven. And then uh, they go to the NBA. F in game seven, I didn't want to add, he had 23 19 Seven blocks. Yep. That's yeah. that. This is what I mean. Game seven, he takes over. It's like this is what you brought me for. <laughs> Maybe the 76ers aren't making these this finals against the Lakers. You know what I mean? Yeah, hey, I could such go a, to have a whole career without a finals appearance. Exactly. Oh my God, and then they go on and they beat the Lakers in game one. Just game one. <laughs> To give the Lakers their only playoff loss of that entire year, dude. That conference finals they played San Antonio. Oh man, that was a. That, I think that Spurs team won sixty games. They yeah. got sweat. They got shellac. They got sweat. It was crazy. And then they they proceeded to go and beat the 76ers four straight games. Where you think that Lakers team was so good? Oh gosh. Whew. Anyway. Yep. Two thousand one, two thousand two. Uh, he's playing. Uh, in 80 games. This, this is the last of his double double seasons. So this he's is when his over 10 years in the league. This is when his age and his size start to come into factor. Because remember, as a rookie, so if it's 91, he's 25. Yep, he's 25 as a rookie. So that he's you always 35 now. Yeah, you always forget that. Um, 11.5 and 10 rebounds a game. Um, 
he uh, ended up going to the playoffs and lose to Boston in the first round. In the first. People were talking about practice. Mm hmm. Yeah, they they Talking about practice. I was just gonna say this is one where a great team got locker room. Yeah, you know what I mean. They got locker room to where it was definitely like a mental thing with them where they weren't playing for each other anymore. Yeah, uh, but because he's almost like Kenny Lofton, where he's such a nice guy, and you know exactly what you're gonna get out of him. That he's an in demand individual for people, certain teams. People say he literally is that locker room guy where it like is just a big smile every day and he's like happy to be there and he's like really hard to understand. Yeah. <laughs> but you see the smile and you're just like I'm having a great time. Yeah, no, I'm seriously. I'm having a great time. So, uh in 2002 uh before the 2002-2003 season, uh in August 6th, uh he's traded to the New Jersey Nets for Todd McCullough and Keith Van Horn because they're trying to follow the exact same formula as the 76ers did. Yes. Because they made the finals the year before and got absolutely tattooed by the Lakers. And it's not a bad trade outside of the fact that when he goes to New Jersey, he injures his wrist mm -hmm. and just... This is like, I think he plays like 25 games. Yeah, and the, in the postseason, he plays very sparingly. And by God, could they have used him in the finals against Robinson and Duncan? Yep. And Duncan has, I think, almost a quadruple double. In yeah, game yeah. Six. So it's like. And that's why they brought him in. That's what sucks is like he, his age and is really just starts to catch up with them this season at the Nets where you can tell they were actually kind of bummed with how it kind of played out. Yeah. Um, 2003, before that year, he signs with the Knicks. Um, kind of now. But that's the thing I think that helps him is his defense allowed him to play probably a lot longer. Oh, yeah. Than, you know, not to say he was a bad offensive player at all. It's just his defense is what made it teams want to employ him and made him valuable late into his into his you know career because just having him on the court he doesn't even have to be your starting center you know mm -hmm. um in 2004 um he ends up uh, being traded to the rockets right yeah so well he goes to the, the right? yeah so yeah. it's he, this is when he starts to become like the real journeyman and a lot of people thought he was about to retire when he gets traded around like this so he goes Knicks Bulls Bulls to the Rockets and when he's he, in Houston right now Chris and this is exactly what people said was if he didn't go to Houston he, he probably would have retired in 2007 but he goes to Houston and one Yao Ming is there and mm -hmm. they're like dude this is like the perfect coach player and he backs him up for like multiple years he plays a long hat from 2004 to 2009 it's crazy I mean and God, if Yao didn't get hurt, though. But, like, the perfect yeah. center coach of maybe the best defensive center of his era. Of his, yes. No, yeah. you're 100% right. And he also was, like, you know, me and Yao kind of, like, connected because he was a foreigner. I was a foreigner. We were both humongous. They were both actually from, like, I think Yao's parents were kind of, like, uh, athletes. But, like, they were definitely in that. Uh, realm ac yes of uh, like academics too so like they connected on like a bunch of stuff and it, not only does he back him up but there's times in which they play him and he's actually still viable but he just can't he just doesn't have the miles or he has too many miles yeah whatever too many miles too much tread on those dikembe tires that's right and then too much tread. mount matumbo's gotten too many winters <laughs> too many too much of that denver snow drive oh man <laughs> but uh the Rockets end up developing into a good team. They just can't get out of the West. They yep. just can't get out of the way of specific teams. Um, finally, in 2009, they beat Portland in six. But this is the postseason where Yao gets hurt. Yep. And they have to play the Lakers. And uh, and he's just too old to step in and be the same effective. And he, he's also hurt in game two in Portland. Oh, yeah. So you, now, now your front court is completely decimated. Yep. Um, April 23rd, 2009. Uh, or... No, September 23rd, 2009. He retires from the NBA. Yeah. After, what, 17, 18 I think 18. Seasons? Yeah. That's... 18 seasons. Uh, Hall of Fame, eight All-Stars. And my, I think, is the best. He actually has this tied with B -B 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 Ben Wallace. Yeah. Is four defensive players of the year it, it, in the era that he got them. That's the other thing that I think is so, because that really the 80s 90s nba was the hardest defense i think we'll ever and see and where centers like would they, like they already have pole position to win that award yes and not just you 
10 other guys. Exactly. Um, as far as that defensive player of the year, though, even though he won four, he was in the top three for nine straight years. Yes, he was always in the... <laughs> yes. Like, that's ridiculous. It's been second all-time in for, block shots. Yep. Like, I mean, he... Fantastic player. Mm -hmm. and it's like nobody kind of thinks about him. No. He, he never really stuck with one team. Yes. I feel like if he played his whole career in Denver, it might be. And he never different. he had one championship run that they got swept. Or almost, whatever, four to one. We'll call it one and a half. Yeah. But you know what I mean. Yeah. So, like, he, he just, you're right, where he just isn't, like, at the forefront of even the centers from that era. Yeah. You know, not even players, centers. Uh, you want to talk about him being a little humanitarian? Yeah, that's, let's that's do that. pretty ridiculous how much he does. He's always been involved in the Special Olympics. Yep. Um, a huge contributor and like like a whatever celebrity kind of thing that comes around. Um, we and talk then, about a lot of athletes who are not good guys, he, like a certain mailman postal worker from the Utah area. This is the exact opposite of that. Yes. No, and actually what was interesting, I saw an interview with him that said it was a very Georgetown um, mentality coming from them, and they said, like, Alonzo Mourning's like this. He's just, like, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, and Dikembe's like this, and Ewing, and, like, it's a very interesting, like, uh, thing that he said that he was, like, his family and this going to Georgetown that made him want to be a full-on... All right, I'm not going to finish that one. <laughs> Just a good guy. Just a good guy. Just a good guy. Um, he built a hospital in his hometown. It was the first one built there in like 40 years or some shit. Oh, jeez. Um, and he said this because he got it all through like donations and, and charitable work. And he was just like, yeah, I'm trying to teach guys you don't necessarily have to donate your money, but donating your time is so valuable because you have like this celebrity status. Yeah, like if you show up, people will also foot some of the bill. You, just, you, know, you don't need to dump all your money. Not just ghost baseball players. No, not just ghost if you show up, players. they will come. <laughs> Um, his son plays basketball now. I did see that. I yep. thought that was pretty cool. Yep. His yep. son playing for old uh, Ewing. Yeah, that's right. He went to Georgetown. Went to Georgetown. So. So keeping it in the family. There will be another generation. We'll be here like 30 years later talking about it. That would be that. awesome. <laughs> I love that. We got, dude, we got Sabone Zone's Sub son. Sabone it. Zone's son is killing it. Oh, my God. Sacramento. He's so good on the Kings. Oh, man. It's, it's a brand new Sabone Zone. A oh, whole new world. You know what it is? He's got both. He's got two good ankles. And that's when you bring people into the Sabone zone and you have good ankles, you can... Yeah, you can... When you're not running around like Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah. feel so bad for him with that. I mean, the damn Soviets ruined his career. <laughs> ah, rocket. Uh, thank you.